Good afternoon. afternoon. I'm Pastor Larry Seaford. I have the privilege of serving God's people at St. Bartholomew Lutheran Church in Cacollin, as well as the members of Holy Cross in Standish, Michigan. Michigan, and it is my pleasure and privilege to be with you today as we continue to contemplate the theme, God on Trial. And today we take a look at the misconceptions that were associated with the trial of our Savior. The order of service that we follow is printed for you in your service folder, and we begin with the singing of hymn 432, O dearest Jesus, what law have you broken? Please stand. In the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden, amen. Amen. I confess that I am by nature sinful. I am guilty of many sins. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me. For all this I am sorry. I pray for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Jesus says to his people, If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. 
His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. By the authority of Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated as we sing hymn two from the red hymnal. Psalm 2. We pray, Lord, keep us safe in the refuge of your anointed Son, so when the nations rage against him, we are not terrified. You have begotten him from eternity and have seated him on your throne in heaven. Let us see him as he truly is, the one who lives and rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We proceed with the anthem, O dearest Jesus.
God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours through the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our consideration here this afternoon are the words of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, the first 12 verses. The whole group of them got up and brought him before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say, Jesus replied. Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they kept insisting. He stirs up the people, teaching all through Judea, beginning from Galilee all the way here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For a long time he had wanted to see Him because he had heard many things about Him. He hoped to see Him see some miracle performed by Him. He questioned Him with many words, but Jesus gave Him no answer. The chief priests and the experts in the law stood there, vehemently accusing Him. Herod, along with his soldiers, treated Him with contempt and ridiculed Him, dressing Him in bright clothing, He sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this day, they had been enemies of each other. This is the word of our Lord. Dear fellow redeemed through the blood of Christ, I think it's safe to say that no one mentioned in the verses of this text really understood Jesus. There were many who had misconceptions as to who Jesus is and what Jesus had come to do. The first people that are mentioned in our text are mentioned as a whole group or assembly. These are the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, the same people who had put Jesus on trial during the middle of the night and then railroaded Him through a mock quick trial early in the morning in which they had condemned Jesus to death. They said He was worthy of death because He claimed to be the Son of God. They refuse to believe that He is indeed the Son of God. They wanted Him dead, but they didn't have the authority to carry out that kind of sentence. And so as early and as quickly as they can on Friday morning, they hurry Him off and put Him in front of the Roman governor. the official accusations that the Sanhedrin now brought against Jesus in Pilate's court are a little different than the one they condemned Him of in their own court. And these accusations that they bring before Pilate are half-truths and lies. The first lie was that they claimed that Jesus was misleading the nation Actually, Jesus was doing just the opposite. Jesus was teaching people the correct teachings of God's Word. He was trying to straighten out the twisted mess of teachings that the Jewish leaders had been feeding to the people of Israel. The second lie that they put before Pilate is that they say that Jesus opposed the paying of taxes to Caesar. Well, as soon as you and I hear that, our minds jump right away to Mark chapter 12 where Jesus says, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God 
what is God's. The Lord did not oppose the paying of taxes. And then there's the half-truth that the Jewish leaders shared with Pilate that stated that Jesus claims to be the Messiah, a king. And Jesus did claim to be the Messiah. But God's definition of the Messiah was much different than the kind of Messiah that the Jews were hoping for. One who would free them from Rome's grip. One who would be a powerful throne, or sit on a, a king sitting on a throne in all kinds of power. A king over soldiers and over large land masses. That's what the Jews were looking for in the Messiah. But God's definition of the Messiah was quite different from that. Because God had said that the Messiah, the true Messiah, the one that had been promised since the fall into sin with Adam and Eve, He would come to set people free from sin, from death, from the power of the devil. And God's Messiah would rule, but He would rule a spiritual kingdom of hearts and souls. The Jewish leaders had misconceptions about the Messiah and they didn't understand Jesus because they chose not to understand Jesus because they preferred their own version of the story. Pilate, he also didn't understand Jesus but for a whole different set of reasons. And as you study the Gospels, and you see Pilate in the Gospels, you kind of get the impression that Pilate didn't know much about Jesus before Friday morning. And then early Friday morning, in bursts this angry crowd, and they thrust Jesus in front of Pilate and are accusing him of being a king. And if Jesus actually were the type of king that the Jews were accusing Him of, well then this would have been a crime of treason against Rome, and it would have been a crime that would be punishable by death. But Pilate saw right through the jealousy of the Jews, and he sees that Jesus is not a king that is a threat to Caesar, or to Rome. So Pilate just wanted the whole mess to go away. To be done with it. And yet the Jews would not give up. They were out for blood. And, and when the Jews mentioned that Jesus was from Galilee, Pilate mistakenly thought he had found his way out of this predicament. Because Galilee was under the jurisdiction of Herod. And so Pilate sent the whole trial. Jesus, all the witnesses, all the accusers, and everyone in that crowd that came along on Friday morning. He sent them all to Herod, who is in town for the Passover. And Herod, well, he had wanted to see Jesus for a long time. You see, he had heard about the, the miracles that Jesus had been performing during his ministry. He had heard about the preaching and the teaching that he was doing. And so Herod was intrigued by Jesus. Herod thought that he was in for a morning of fantastic entertainment from Jesus because he thought he might possibly see some miracles done on demand. But Jesus didn't do any miracles in front of Herod. And Jesus responded to none of the questions that were brought before him as he stood before Pilate. Jesus did nothing. Jesus said nothing in the courtroom of Herod at all. 
So Herod's excitement changed to disappointment and then to boredom. And he sent Jesus and all of his accusers back to Pilate. You know, there are many people in the world today who attempt to put our God on trial because the God of the Bible does not match their concept of what they think a God should be. In that sense, the people of our world today have a lot in common with the people here in our text. Like the Jewish leaders, there are some people today who seem to be against Jesus because they feel that His teaching is a threat to their way of life that they have gotten used to and are comfortable with. They know Him, but they don't like Him. Like Pilate, there are others who seem to be guided more by apathy than hatred. They don't know much about Jesus, but they're not really interested enough to learn anything else either. And then there are those like Herod. They've heard things about Jesus, and they're intrigued. They've heard that Jesus is a friend of sinners, and so they assume that Jesus will approve of their choices and their way of life because they have heard that Jesus just wants them to be happy. And so they assume that He will approve of the way that they conduct themselves. Maybe they've heard that Jesus can help turn a person's life around, and so they think that kind of Jesus will wave a magic wand, and all of their troubles will disappear. But when they learn more about Jesus, and they realize who Jesus really is, and what Jesus taught, and what Jesus came to do, and they realize that He's different than what they had hoped for, and they lose interest. They become bored, and they send Jesus away. They don't want anything to do with Him. What about us? Where are we in this account as we consider it here today. Let us consider for a moment what we might have in common with the people who are standing against Jesus in this account. There are times when you and I misconceive who Jesus is. We kind of treat Him like a divine vending machine with our hand out looking for all the blessings that we can possibly get, but only the blessings that we are interested in and want. And then we get angry when we don't receive those blessings that we think we should have. We accept what we consider to be the good, but we complain under the trouble and the trying times as if we think that we should never have to carry a cross because we're Christians. And perhaps we think we can enjoy the forgiveness that our Savior offers to us without forgiving those who sin against us? Or we decide we're going to use the forgiveness of Jesus as a license to sin. We're going to do whatever we want to do. And then later, we'll just ask for forgiveness. The problem we have is that we share with everyone else in this story, whether we want to admit it or not, an inward focus. A sinful inward focus. 
The Jewish leaders, they were thinking only about their political and cultural influence. Pilate was only thinking about his career. Herod? He was just thinking about an afternoon or morning of entertainment. We are sinners just like them. And our sin warps the view that we have of Jesus so that we are tempted to see only what we want to see and only when we want to see it. There were many misconceptions about Jesus held by the people in our text today. There were many misconceptions that were held by the disciples of Jesus as well, even still on Easter Sunday morning. There are many misconceptions about Jesus today as well. Sometimes those misconceptions are in our own minds and hearts. We mistakenly think that we have to do something in order to assist in our salvation as if Christ was not able to do what He proclaimed on Good Friday when He said it is finished. Nothing left to do. Too often we think that we have to take things into our own hands because, well, God just isn't acting. Or God isn't acting fast enough or acting in the way that we think He should. We have our own misconceptions of Jesus. Because we do not consistently go back into the Scriptures and study who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and how that applies to our day-to-day lives. So let's look at who Jesus really is in this text. Let's look at our God on trial. By the time that He stands before Herod, this is His third trial of the morning, and it's not even 9 a.m. yet. And at every one of those trials, He is mocked and mistreated and accused falsely. He knows the path that He is on is leading to a cross. And that's exactly where He wants to go. Because in that moment, while all of this was going on around Him, Jesus was thinking about you. You were on His mind, and you were in His heart. At that moment, He was focused on the fact that He is your substitute. That He is your sacrifice that has paid for every one of your sins. That He is your Savior, your only Savior, and hope of eternal life in heaven. You were on His heart and mind as all of this was going on because Jesus wants you to be with Him forever in heaven. This is the Jesus that we want the whole world to know and to see. You see, Jesus is better than any magician that is performing for entertainment or waving a wand to try and wipe away all of our troubles. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one and the only one who washes away all of your sin. He has freed us from death. He has freed us from the hell that we deserve. He loves us. He does not approve of our sins. But He also does not leave us trapped in that sin. He forgives us. And then He empowers us with His Holy Word to fight against temptation. To fight against sin. To resist the schemes of Satan. There are many misconceptions about Jesus in the world today. And that is why God has given us His Holy Word. We have a great message to share. 
that teaches the truth about Jesus and it clears up all those misconceptions. Jesus came to testify to the truth. Jesus has called every one of us here today to join Him in testifying to that truth. Jesus has told us in His Word that we will be called upon to stand before authorities and the people of this world to share with them who the real Jesus is. He promises in those moments He will make us bold to do so. The Holy Spirit has shown us that this man on trial in front of Pilate and Herod is God. He is our Lord and our Savior. He is God's gift to the world. A gift that we get to share. A gift that never diminishes in its worth, never spoils, never fades. It's a gift that grants forgiveness, life, and salvation to all who believe. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the offertory, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Please stand for prayer. O God, our Father, by Your mercy and might, 
the world turns safely into darkness and returns to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, Now Rest Beneath Night's Shadows. Pastor has left me a couple announcements to share with you. It says, uh, to help the Lent Supper staff be ready and prepared to serve us, we will not say the common table prayers here. We ask when you go downstairs to take a seat at the tables. When things are ready, Pastor will say the common table prayers with you and then you can get in line for food. 
And then uh, the other announcement is to remember, especially the voters, that there is a call meeting scheduled for this Sunday after the 1030 service for the next principal and 7th and 8th grade teacher. God's blessings as you continue your walk on our Lenten journey that we know culminates with the celebration of the empty tomb and the resurrection of our Savior.